It all started in the studios of WLWD Channel 2 in Dayton, where the Phil Donahue Show was born. But while other TV talkers of the era had their fair share of big-name stars and best-selling authors, and don't get me wrong, Mr. Donahue had a few of those too, but this show was going to be different from the get-go. The first guest back in 1967, controversial atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare. The newsmakers of the day lined up to appear, but what also made this show very different, a groundbreaker, Phil included his studio audience in the process. Yes, they got a chance to ask questions of the guests too, as did the home audience who phoned in. As Phil would later say, they had better questions than he did. From there, the show was syndicated nationally, eventually moving to Chicago and New York City for an unprecedented 29-year run. One of Phil's most beloved and popular guests was nationally syndicated newspaper columnist Irma Bombeck. Hundreds of thousands of readers laughed along with Irma in her weekly column at Wit's End, highlighting family life with husband Bill and the kids that most American moms and dads could relate to, her humorous take on life. As Phil told me in a recent interview, I would bring Irma on and let her do what she did best, Irma being Irma. But Irma was much more than a guest. You see, she and Phil were good friends. Before they both hit it big, Phil was on the radio here at WHIO in Dayton, and Irma wrote for the Kettering Oakwood Times. But more importantly, they were neighbors here on Cushwa Drive in Centerville. The Bombecks at 162, and the Donahues across the street at 151. It was a wonderful friendship that lasted up until Irma's death in 1996. Phil was asked by Bill and the kids to speak at Irma's funeral, and speak he did. She became a, an historic figure of publishing and of newspapering. It is not so much that she was the best, she was the only. And there is no other time when the phrase is more appropriate to say then. Now, we shall never see her likes again. And that brings us to today. Phil remains good friends with the Bombeck family and has appeared here at the Writers' Workshop in the past, and we're happy to have him back. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, from the former resident here at 151 Kushwa to major TV talk show icon, I present to you... Hey! Get off my grass! Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> hey, you know what? Irma's right. The grass is greener over the septic tank. Look at that. Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Phil Donahue. I'm going. I'm going. Well, my dear, look at who's here. Um, I've had my picture taken with all of you. And as you stand there with the arm around, waiting, and the person with the camera goes up, you can develop a relationship standing there with the... <clears throat> I, you must know, uh, and by the way, Book, Jim, this was a, a very clever intro, and I never saw my tree in front of my yard that large before. <clears throat> Imagine what, what this is like for me. I came here in 1959. There were five General Motors plants in Dayton then. Uh, I can name three, and you're going to help me. Frigidaire. Inland Manufacturing, Delco Moraine, and Delco Inland, thank you. Am I the oldest person in this room? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm used to this because I, fame is fleeting. In 1980, I married uh, Marlo Thomas. And... Uh, <coughs> My father-in-law, Danny Thomas, got up to toast. And he said, I haven't lost a daughter, I've gained a fundraiser. <laughs> and it wasn't long after that that I, you know, I think it was somewhere in the, during the reception, I realized that I married a hospital. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I mean, everywhere I go, of course, uh, people knock me over to get to Marlow. And I'm getting kind of used to it. It's not easy. Oh, that girl, we just loved it. Whatever happened to Donald? Oh, and free to be you and me. Oh, William, 
William wants a doll. Oh, my children. I raised all my children on... And I'm standing there. And sooner or later, somebody in the crowd will turn to me and say, Oh, and we like you too, Merv. Uh, so, I was, you know, a little concerned uh, when, uh, coming back here, who's, who's going to recognize me? Well, oh, well, no. <laughs> believe me, believe me, I'll get through life okay. I mean, I mean. And it's true. Irma Bombeck lived across the street from us. And ever since this became a, an item in the papers, people have asked me, you know, what was Irma like? What was... And I, I have, I, you know, it happens, it's happening, you don't do a lot of analyzing. Irma came across the street one day to interview me for the Kettering Oakwood Times. She was, uh, that was her only paper. And I was thrilled. I mean, I, I had a radio show. And nobody ever wanted to interview me. And I couldn't wait. You had to wait a week for the article to come out, you know. And there's my name, Phil Donahue, right there in the newspaper. Well, my dear. Uh, and of course, as you would expect, it, I, I, it, she was there to interview me about a radio show that I, had, I did. I called Conversation Piece on WHIO the voice of the Miami Valley. Uh, and of course, we all both had stair-step kids, two, four, six. Um, we had, uh, we were both on the uh, parish council. And then suddenly, we both started getting attention. And I mean, she really started getting attention. Of the top 10 best-selling books of of the decade of the 70s, Irma had two. So, I mean, this was a fina. And you, you know, you, you, uh, it was a time when uh, sexism was palpable uh, in both industries. You know, the old white guys who ran newspapers uh, wouldn't consider putting a woman on the op-ed page. Are you serious? All women care about is covered dishes and needlepoint. <laughs> In many ways, I was confronting the same 1960s attitude. Uh, the, the, the daytime television was game shows and soap operas. Come on down! <laughs> and uh, Monty Hall was giving away $5,000 to a woman dressed like a chicken salad sandwich. <laughs> and I came along with two talking heads. You know, it couldn't be more visually boring. <laughs> and so, you know, I guess we did in many, I guess I have to, you know, I, I have a worldwide reputation for humility, as you know. <laughs> <clears throat> but I have to, you know, I'm proud of that. We broke a mold. <laughs> and at the same time, so did Irma. Uh, you know, Irma will, I, I brought some, clips from our shows that range from 1989. Uh, you're going to love these. I look like I just made my first communion. Uh, up until 1993. Uh, not very long, but certainly you'll see Irma as she was. You know, and she broke molds. She did things that are different. Uh, she, Irma hated pretense. She hated it. I mean, you could, you know, treacly stuff. Uh, she didn't like the, the, the pretense that was so rampant and remains in this nation today. Uh, you know, we're the, you know, exceptional, exceptional. And, uh, you know, the harm's way. Boys, our soldiers don't die. They, they fall. They're fallen. All this language, she, she didn't like that. It wasn't honest. And she, oh, I remember we were in St. Louis. And there's Irma on a huge view, venue. We had about 4,000 people and nine balconies that, you know, straight up. And there was little Irma on the stage, all by herself. And a woman, I'm running around, and I'm in the top balcony, and a woman stands up in the back row. And she says, Irma, I understand you were Phil Donahue's neighbor. 
what's Phil Donahue really like? And she said, he peeks in windows. So, I mean, I mean, she, she was fabulous. She knew how, to, you know, uh, she'll say it in a moment, but she, uh, motherhood was sacred. Oh, how blessed you are. Oh, what a wonderful mother. Mothers were on pedestals. And Irma would do a column, you know, like something to the effect of, I am going to sell my children. <laughs> so, she, you know, she punctured that pretense. And she began to, she was speaking for millions of women. And her columns hung on refrigerator doors all over the world, literally. And she was my neighbor, and I knew her personally. And, and when I put her on my show, it was just like a blank check. There was, uh, there was no gamble at all. All I had to do was stand there. And I couldn't get, I couldn't get to the audience fast enough. Um, here is, uh, let me show you just, uh, this is only seven minutes long. so. Uh, the first, this is 19, I'll tell you when I can find, 79, 1979. Uh, the first is from San Diego, and then you'll see a, she's in a different dress. <laughs> we just cut these together. Uh, 1978, San Diego, California, Irma is on Phil's show, her old neighbor. You took a trip. Did you get a Winnebago finally? Did Bill rent a Winnebago? Or... No, no, we bought one. Oh, I see. We, we bought this turkey. All right. I mean, this whole thing. And we, it, it, was, it was 23 feet long, and it, it was a house trailer. And, you know, everyone was doing it. They were going camping, and we thought, you know, we'd head out for the hills together. So we, we got in this thing. And, and probably, if your marriage can stay put together after you have parked a trailer, you're going to weather anything. It's not going to matter what you do after that. But they would pull... They would, they would pull this, this trailer out, and we would all get outside, and my husband would say, now hold it. Everyone help me park this thing. We'd say, right, okay. So we all, we all took positions, and then he'd say, okay, and we'd say, turn the wheels. And he'd say, which, which way? Which way? He'd say, that way. And, then, and he, he, he was always going the wrong way. At, at one point, he said, you know, I can't park this trailer anymore when it's raining. You know that. And we said, it's not raining. You have just run over the hookups. And, you know, the whole thing is it's a mess, absolute mess. You have, uh, throughout the trip, which apparently lasted about 100 years in your consciousness. Yeah, we, we made about three miles a day. Yeah, you have... Uh... <laughs> Irma, I know you didn't start on a nationally syndicated column right. and in your laundry room. So where, how, how did you start? In okay, room? I started uh, on, a, on a weekly paper out in um, uh, Kettering, Ohio. Tell them who one of your uh, interviewees was at the time. Uh, I interviewed a man who uh, had a windmill that he had played, uh, paid $10,000 for. Um, I interviewed uh, a woman who was a painter. I interviewed a fellow who uh, we never thought he'd get anywhere. <laughs> Who had a show called Conversation Piece over the radio and WHIO, Phil Donahue. <laughs> and uh, all the biggies. I, I'll <laughs> tell you, uh, that would be 63, <laughs> somewhere like that? Let me see, 65. Oh. Well, yeah, Whatever 63, yeah. And 64. I just couldn't wait for that. You know, but the trouble is you had to wait three days for the paper to come out. <laughs> I uh, delivered it. I oh, mean, you know. <laughs> I should have remembered. <laughs> yes. I did. Yes. I wonder about her ironing board. That was probably the it's most still wonderful. Up. Is it? It's Great. still up. It hadn't, that ironing board hadn't been down in, oh, God, 10 years. Yes. <laughs> I was wondering, did you ever screen your daughter's dates? <laughs> screen her dates? <laughs> Listen, I am so anxious for her to get married. I'm advertising. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Uh, no, no. Um, she has pretty good taste, I think. I, at least I, I think she does. <laughs> She's very, very attractive, too. Betsy is a lovely and bright, he said, I'm acknowledging sure. the presence of some feminist. <laughs> yeah. How many columns have you written, and do you ever go blank where you're afraid you can't think of a new subject? Oh. 
Let's see. I don't know how many columns I've written. 13 years of them, somewhere along the line, three a week, uh, plus the freelance for Good Housekeeping and McCall's and Family Circle, plus the two scripts a week for Good Morning America. And do I go blank? Oh, yes, indeed. I wanted to ask Emma how uh, you reacted when your, uh, your sons and daughters uh, started driving. Uh, when they started, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, when they started to drive, I was in my... Um, early 30s, and it threw me into menopause. <laughs> right that one day, absolutely. You know, the president uh, made you the first secretary of suburbia. What do you think you would do? First secretary of suburbia, what would I do? Oh, boy. Golly, I'd probably move to the city. <laughs> Apparently, your observation that if a man watches how many quarters of... 168 televised football games a week. Then he's what? Declared legally dead. <laughs> I just want to know if you got a Christmas newsletter this year. Did I get Christmas newsletters? Ad nauseum, I got Christmas newsletters. Because I have come out and been very vocal against Christmas newsletters. I, I don't want to know that your three-year-old conducted the symphony. I don't want to know this. <laughs> I mean, that, that is very boring to me, and I don't want to know all that. I, I don't want to know uh, that you are running for the U.S. Senate or that you've needlepointed a piano. None of those <laughs> things are important to me. And also, I, I'm, I'm on this. I'm going to stay on it. It just drives me crazy when, when I get a, a Christmas newsletter that says, well, you know that we lost the house because we couldn't keep up on the payments. Grandfather is uh, happy now. Uh, he was 97, and we buried him on, on uh, Christmas Eve of last year. And they go on all these sad yeah. things, and they say, but have a happy holiday. You, uh, I don't know, did you read Total Woman? Oh, yes. Uh, did yes. you attempt? Uh... I love fiction. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. None of it works, Phil. None of it. You're not up to uh, wrapping yourself in saran wrap and meeting Bill when he comes home from work. No, I, 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 I told you the story about how I, I called my husband at work, and I said, Bill, if you come home early today, you can have your way with me. And he put me on hold. Emma, <laughs> when your children were young, how did you do it? How were you creative, plus scour and flush? 12 o'clock um, midnight? Or? I wasn't too creative scouring and flushing. I put all of it on the other side. <laughs> I'm a lousy housekeeper. I'm not a good cook. In fact, the, the kids say, you know, uh, one of their favorite lines is, um, I'm always telling them, if, if you don't shape up, I'm going to put you to bed with dinner. <laughs> and that does it. Uh, Irma? Yes? I wonder, I, I think your humor is marvelous, Thank but you. how do your children react to some of the put-downs, although humorous? Who cares? I don't know. <laughs> In combining your marriage and your career, did you find that some days you just couldn't cope, and what did you do? Yeah, I've, I've, I found a, a lot of days that I couldn't cope, but uh, before I wrote this book, my, I have to admit, my, my life was coming together pretty good. Uh, I felt sort of good about myself. Uh, my age was no longer a problem, I'm very honest, I'm somewhere between estrogen and death. <laughs> and, uh, I would like to know your advice. Um, I'm sure you've heard that mothers cannot get sick. What do you do when you are so sick that you can't lift your head off the pillow um, and your children need you? What is your advice? I, uh, my advice is they're never going to believe you're sick until you throw up and do it. <laughs> Just do it. I think there's a message here for all of us. Yeah, the door is wide open for you the people who aspire to sharing ideas. And by the way, I'm not sure a picture is worth a thousand words. I think a hundred words creates more vivid pictures than, you, than, than uh, is possible in a actual photograph. The imagination is what is so unique to us. We're the only people who know that we know. You know, we, we know, for example, we're mortal. Uh, that's why we, uh, we developed the uh, behavior of comedy or laughter. We laugh because we know we're going to die. 
My dogs don't laugh because they don't know they're going to die. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell them. So it's this bulletin that only, as far as we know, we are the only living creatures who know this with this kind of imagination. And that's where words come in. It is really, it is true. The pen is way more powerful than the sword. And we should all appreciate that, especially you who, who have already expressed uh, your interest in, in writing and also demonstrated that you're good at it. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. And so that's, I think that's Irma's lesson. And the opportunity to skewer the balloons of pretense are everywhere. And I, know, and, uh, I think this is certainly one of the many reasons that Irma has become so uh, such a great memory for all of us and how cruel she was taken away from us. Uh, here we are in Chicago, 1981. My dear, this is 33 years ago. I'm going to need somebody to help me to my chair. Your impact, uh, you were really the first woman to get on the editorial page with any kind of visibility. Mary McGrory and others uh, should not be omitted here, but you really came bursting onto that, and this was a major concession. These, you know, these old white men that run those papers <laughs> don't let everybody in, especially women. Uh, I first of all think it's very flattering that, and certainly your copies deservedly on those next well, to all these other big hitters. Don't, don't get too choked up about it. They they let women, <laughs> they let women on the pages because we're the little money makers. Uh, Ann Landers, Dear Abby, Sylvia Porter. The Bombeck columns probably uh, get as much revenue of any syndicated columnist yeah. around, and more. I don't know of anyone who has more than, than uh, 14, 1,500 papers, which Anne and yeah. Abby both have, uh, each. <laughs> and that's a lot of papers. I don't have that many papers. Now, the people, what, the, uh, many uh, sociologists or people who make it their business to look us over and see who we are and how we're changing, mm -hmm. saw you as a kind of barometer. I mean, your copy was very reflective of what was happening. Your humor was with, was stood all by itself, and I think has and continues to have no equal. But uh, beyond that humor, there were some other things you were saying. And as you, as you got in more papers, and as you grew, and as the kids got older, and Becky went off to school, and all all those things, uh, you 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 started reflecting some. Real heavy things to some people. Well, I, I, he's given me all the credit for this, and he's being very nice. I had a lot of people running interference for me. People, and you're going to be surprised, like Phyllis Diller. Phyllis Diller was one of the first women in this country to admit that maybe being married and raising children was not a religious experience. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> then you had people like Jean Kerr, who came out with her books, uh, who also s had some irreverence to it. And we looked at this, and, and I think we were all sort of taken back and said, you know, thank God somebody finally said it. And I think people in humor fields, maybe they weren't writing, but I, I, I think they paved the way for, for people like me, you know. And then after a while, you got so, I, I, I would get, the first five or ten years I did the column, I would get people who would take me aside and say, are you serious? I mean, you, you don't really mean that, do you? And I'd say, yes, I do. <laughs> and they'd say, oh, you know. And it took them a while to live with it because they, they were not admitting these things to themselves, I think. Like? Well, like... Like maybe husbands are taking uh, too much advantage of our own good grace and service. Yeah, well, and li like, you know, getting up in the morning and getting the bent fork or something. Or why is it I always got the egg with the yolk was broken? They'd say, Mom, your egg's done. You know, <laughs> why me? I mean, why? You know, and you were saying these things, and you were questioning it, when indeed, if you were a mother, you were supposed to, to sacrifice and, and do all those things. You weren't supposed to have a life of your own. Your life was, was to serve your kids. And don't forget it. Yeah. Uh, now that's, that's changing. I think it's changing. You're, you're, be you're beginning to question, no, wait a minute, you know, just, just call a halt. I'm a person. And, and uh, you know, I, I need some respect from you, and you have to, uh, you have to figure my feelings. Uh, but it does seem as though we've still got, a, we've got an awful lot working against today's woman. First of all, if she doesn't look like she's in the Diet Pepsi commercial, then she's 
th that's one problem. We certainly. Oh, tell me. Look, look at this, Bill. The last person who saw me in a pleated skirt went blind. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> oh, tell me. About it. Hate that. We have come no distance, my friend. No distance at all. <laughs> uh, the uh, many women are giving themselves the opportunity to uh, move out, to go outside the home for work. Say after the kids are, in mm -hmm. their view, able to, you know, wave goodbye and walk to the car. <laughs> Feed themselves. But then they're 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 going out into a world which is not providing altogether that many opportunities for them. That's true. And, you know, clerking at the local discount store is not exactly a mind-bending or a mind-enlarging experience. Yeah, but it's the first time that a woman has ever been paid for something she does or been appreciated for what she does. She gets a thank you out there. there there's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with, with, with being a homemaker and with being a housewife. Nothing. I, f I found it had some moments to it. But my gosh, <laughs> it had some moments to it. But it, it, to go all that time and not have anyone really come out and say, I appreciate this. And it's not the fault of husbands. It's not the fault of kids. They just were never trained to do that. They didn't figure you needed it. You got it from someplace that you really didn't know where. Uh, aren't you amazed, though, at how, how the, the culture has changed, say, from the 50s when mm. you and I were... Uh, over the septic tank, and uh, <laughs> and now and the world Yours was mushier than mine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and now uh, the world in which our kids will. Yeah, I can't get over it. It's 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 going to get better. My kids wanted to know what the favorite song was when I was in high school, and then the lyrics. <laughs> I had to tell them. These are the lyrics of the biggest song. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. <laughs> Irene, good night. Good night, Irene. And this is uh, this was a hit. This was our. Uh, and you remembered the words. I think that's terrific. I know. <laughs> We're in Chicago with Irma Bombeck, and we'll be back in just a moment. There is an example of uh, how different she was, and how um, how much she spoke for millions of women who were out there. And she's on the air saying things that they couldn't say because they would look like they weren't a happy, devoted, you know, mother blessed by the Lord with these wonderful children. Oh, God. Um, it's a lesson to all of us, really. And the door has never been as wide, widely open uh, before as it has been now. Publishing is upside down. Nobody knows what the future is. Is it uh, Borders or Barnes & Noble? Which one is dead? Um, uh, honestly, you know, and I think this is your time. I think, you know, you can be the Wright brothers here. You, the, the, you can resurrect a fabulous industry that's important to our future, our culture. Uh, there's no reason why any of us, who, especially those who have the gift, should not be inspired by Irma. But as the years go by and as uh, time moves on, uh, the circumstances and the, the surroundings of our lives did change. Uh, Irma and Bill, her devoted husband, began to take on a little walking around money. The uh, success that she enjoyed rewarded her with uh, a few uh, dollars and cents. And I'm about now to take you to her home in Phoenix, Arizona. Actually, um, what's the name of the? Paradise Valley. Oh, my. Uh, we did a remote. Uh, by the way, uh, this is three years, less, two, a little more than two years before Irma dies. This is uh, 1993. This is her beautiful home in Paradise Valley. Matt and, uh, and uh, Bill are in my audience in New York. Or 1993, yeah, we, no, this is Chicago. And she's on remote. Irma's showing, showing off her house. Here we are. This is very brief. 1993. 
I'm sorry, I have to talk about myself. It's the way I am. I Here, know that. Yeah, so that's my house across the street right there. <laughs> See the garage on the right? And the tree, you remember this, Matt? Sure. And remember oh, how weird, much, sure. you remember how much clean, uh, my house was always so much cleaner than yours. <laughs> oh, get out of here. <laughs> we had uh, petitions, Phil. Listen, uh, oh, yeah. Irma, we paid somewhere between sixteen and $17,000 for those 14, houses. Fourteen nine five. But you got yours before I did. You bought well, first. that's true. That's true. You, we you got a paid, bargain. You paid 14 what? Fourteen nine five. And were there two or three bedrooms? The mine three. goes first. There were three bedrooms, no basement. It was a plat house. We had That's a see-through fireplace. Bill put uh, Bill put uh, beams in your ceiling. We paid sixteen nine, <laughs> four and a quarter percentage uh, interest rates for the. Oh come on, whatever and you happened to those days? Sold it for two hundred thousand. Uh, <laughs> now before you go inside, this I've never been to this house. I'm only pouting a little bit. Irma. Yeah, well, show us the you garden sort of go here. Over Jill. there, yeah, in the corner. You see, you see that statue? Yeah. That's a shrine to all the men who watch 200 televised football games a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, come on in. All right, this is. I tell you, this uh, fountain in the hallway, if I had had that when I was toilet training the kids, it would have been wonderful. <laughs> Listen to that. That's what if that is. <laughs> Th you... This is the room. Okay, this is the room where we really spend time in. Uh, this is a family room, and you'll notice it's decorated so well because I've had a lot to do with this. However, there is one thing in this room that does not belong. It's tacky. It's bad taste. It is this chair. <laughs> His chair. This is Bill's chair, and you'll notice <laughs> that he put a sheepskin car seat <laughs> cover on this thing. Uh, good going, Bill. There you go. People have a thing, Phil, where they, they think I don't cook, they think I don't keep house, they think I don't care about this. I'm a disciple of Martha Stewart. Oh, yeah. I am. I am. I, I, I tell you, I have little... I have little Christmas ornaments that I made out of the, the lint from my dryer, but I can't show it to you. That program began, uh, that very same program began with Irma standing and saying, welcome to the house, Phil, glad you're here. And of course, uh, her husband uh, you know, sat there and didn't say a word until like 40 minutes into the show. <laughs> Bill never, you know, what, sir, a hot dog he wasn't. Uh, but what a wonderful uh, marriage this was. And uh, here's where, you know, reality starts to seep in. Uh, she, was, she was tired. And it was, this is the same show, 1993. Uh, and the, the, she needed a kidney. And so I'm talking, you know, hey, Irma, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And of course, she wants to get moving. And then finally she says, do you mind if I sit down? And I, and I realize, oh, wow, she really is sick. Here's just a, two minutes of that, uh, 1993. Can I go sit down a little bit? Yes, please do. I want, to let, I want these folks to know that your interest in sitting down is, more, is, not, <laughs> is not because you're lazy. Not only no. is your book title A Marriage Made in Heaven or Too Tired for an Affair, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and not only have you had a breast removed recently because uh, you, like uh, the legions of millions of other women around the world, have had to face this uh, lion in the mouth, but sh that isn't bad enough. You're fine with, uh, you're fine with the mastectomy. That, right. uh, that's over. Now we have more information. As you revealed last week, Irma Bombeck has uh, renal failure. Her mm -hmm. kidneys have... Shut down. Irma, you're on dialysis, do I understand this, four times a day? It's four times a day, and it's called polycystic kidneys, and it's a, a thing that is passed down, uh, usually by the mother, and it's a progressive thing. And I've had a really long ride with mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I knew I had this when I was 20 years old, 
and they've just performed really well, and it's just been the, within the last year, year and a half that they started to deteriorate. And they so. did deteriorate, rather. You really went downhill in a hurry. What was it, fatigue yeah. and all that? Just Mostly it's the fatigue. You're just plain wiped out. Uh -huh. You must have heard from thousands of people around the nation similarly uh, afflicted. Gosh, I have. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's just been, it helps a lot. Let me put it that way. It's with the, uh, the same thing with the cancer. When you have people who you've never met before, uh, who don't have faces, don't have names that you've heard, they call you up and they say, hey, babe, we're with you, you know? Yeah. And I can just see this army of people out there who are supportive. Yeah. Helps. Yeah. Mm. You are on the list for a transplant, true. I am, I'm in two kidney banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One so, in uh, San Francisco and one in Phoenix. Yeah, all right, okay. Uh, and it was uh, two and a half years later that uh, I was, I served as pallbearer at uh, the cathedral in downtown Phoenix. The place was, the, the chamber was jammed. Uh, the Requiem Mass was celebrated by the bishop. And uh, a whole lot of publishing biggies were there. And, you know, it was another example of uh, how uncertain our life is and how cruel and random can be the taking of lives. Uh, it certainly was in the case here. Um, you know, it makes you think about your own mortality. I mean, I, you know, if Irma's dead and Steve Jobs is dead, you know, there's probably not much help that can be expected from me. Uh, and it does make you confront uh, the reality. I have the family's permission to share with you uh, my eulogy uh, in the, on the occasion of uh, Irma's death at her funeral. In 1963 in Centerville, Ohio, on Cushwood Drive, I lived diagonally across the street from the Bombex. We were all 30-something and we were making about $15,000 a year. And after you paid the pediatrician, you still had a little walking around money. We all had stair-step kids, and most of us were Catholic. And most of the, the most fun you had, uh, the most fun you could have then on Cushwood Drive in Centerville was at the Bombex, where incidentally there were some places where the grass is greener than at other places. The most fun you could have was at the Bombex. Irma would not let you fail. No matter what kind of joke you, took, you may have told, she was the most generous audience then and now and forever. She laughed at all my jokes. She was working for the Kettering Oakwood Times, if you can call an occasional column working. We would entertain each other in our homes. We had the same house, it was a plat house, $15,000, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a fireplace was $700 extra. Everybody had early American decor. I had an American Eagle from Sears over the fireplace. <laughs> Not brass, black, they were cheaper. The, the Bombex had beams in the ceiling. I mean real wood, early American beams, perfectly mitered. You kept looking for Martha Washington. Bill Bombeck made those beams all by himself. I envied those beams so much. It explains why my relationship with Bill throughout my adult life has been so difficult. <laughs> the spirit of those times has lived in the work of Irma Bombeck ever since 1961. And that is a remarkable thing when you realize what's happened to us since. We were everything our parents prayed that we would be. Our parents sacrificed for us, and by 1961, we had achieved more than they had ever dreamed. We were making more money than they had ever made. And then somebody killed our president, and we lost a war. And the Japanese took over automotive engineering, and a president resigned in disgrace. And we looked up to discover that we were prepared for a world that never materialized. But while cities were burning and all this was happening to us, there was one constant in our culture, and it was Irma Bombeck. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, his, her, spirit, her spirit never flagged. Her humor never waned. Her light shone out from millions of refrigerator doors, just one of the many venues Irma found herself in, and allowed her work to reach the hearts of countless readers around the world. She became an historic figure of publishing and newspapers. It is not so much that she was the best, she was the only. There is no other time when the phrase is more appropriate to say than now. 
We shall never see her likes again. We shall never know again her brilliance, her insight, and especially her, generos her generosity. She is the modern Catholic woman. She is married once, faithful wife, who got more fun out of writing about infidelity than would be approved by the early church. <laughs> she was a 20th century political figure. And when the scholars gather hundreds of years from now to learn about us, they can't know it all if they don't read Irma. For all these reasons, I feel so blessed to, I'm sorry, the older I get, the easier I cry here. I'm so blessed to have known this woman who made me a better person. Not an easy task. I'm so, so grateful for her. I join you in mourning her passing, but she will live. She will live forever. And now, <laughs> Okay, I have permission to share this with you. This is Bill Bombex, the, her husband's tribute to her. And I, I, I won't go through it all. Uh, uh, he he tells a story about when they were in high school. Uh, they're standing, a bunch of dates are standing at Lakeside Park, which used to be an amusement park here in Dayton. And if you remember this, you're the only person here older than me. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they were early, and they couldn't get in the, the ballroom. And the Lakeside Amusement Park was right nearby, and Bill said, let's go. Somebody said, let's go and ride the roller coaster. And all the girls said no, except Irma. <laughs> and off they go, and they get on the, they get on the um, roller coaster. He talks about a man with stained, oil-stained overalls, gets him in, and he's got a lever that goes back like this, two by fours, like that, that. And they get in the car and the bar comes down and the man goes like this and the roller coaster goes up here and down and into tunnels and makes sharp turns and then goes up again. And you realize, this was Bill, you realize that this is a metaphor for their lives. And he ends it this way. We started, we started in a tunnel that served to plunge deeper than all the others. It kept dropping. We both sensed this one was really different. Finally, instead, the bright lights, we were back on the platform. We looked at each other, we didn't speak, and we sensed the code, the ride had changed. The man in the bib overalls was standing by the tapered two by fours. He started to push one from its angle in a straight up position. The car stopped. I told him the ride was great, but it was too short. We wanted, we wanted to go on. The, he raised the bar. She smiled again. I looked at the attendant again. He said, this is April 22nd, 1996. Your ride is over. I looked over at her seat and she was gone. Well, I never forgot these words. And I had a greater appreciation than ever for what, how powerful writing can be. You can move mountains with how you shape the ideas that are in your all, your, all your, your very, very talented brains. We have an assembly of people of conscience here. And what you are able to do with your pen is, uh, achieve beyond your own dreams. It can be done. And your presence here at this workshop is, demonstrates that you just may be the people who will make our lives better and improve the possibility of our children actually being able to get on a bus without worrying about what, whether they just got on the wrong bus or entered the wrong marathon or the wrong airplane. We've got to change this. And we're grateful for our military, and we want them to protect us. We want our military leaders to make the right decisions. But the only people who really have the power to make sure all that happens is the writer, and that's you. And I thank you very much for your attention.